Rebuilding a tangy model steam engine part 14, reaming the old bearings and making a new crankshaft. At the moment this looks a little bit like it's back to front because as you can see there is a crankshaft in the holes. But this was a crankshaft that I made using a different method that I'm going to show in one of the model engineering for beginners episodes. As I believe this engine to be of German origin, the original bearing holes were metric. Using a hand reamer, I very carefully reamed the holes out to an imperial size of 3 8 of an inch, which is a little bit bigger than the original crankshaft. This crankshaft was made by an entirely different method to the one that you're about to see. It's OK, and it fits, but I would like to show a much better way of making a crankshaft. When I try and fit the flywheel onto the shaft, it's a bit tight, and that's because I didn't ream it all the way through, because I forgot I was using a hand reamer, and these start off tapered and become parallel further down. Once I ream it all the way through, the flywheel fits perfectly. But I'm not going to use this small piece of crankshaft that I made. I'm going to use a piece of stock metal bar, which is 3 eighths of an inch in diameter. This piece of steel will be fine for the job. It's a great fit in the bearings and a really good fit through the centre of the flywheel. I'm curious to know what kind of steel this is. It may be stainless steel. I will try it with a magnet. And yes, it is stainless steel because the magnet has no effect. That doesn't mean that all stainless steels are non-magnetic. Some stainless steel is magnetic. But this particular piece of bar is definitely non-magnetic. I wouldn't want to make the crankshaft out of mild steel. I prefer silver steel as it's accurately ground. But this seems to be OK. So I cut a piece of it to the same length as the original crankshaft. And for increased accuracy, I've decided to machine it using one of my ER40 collets. And in this clip, I'm fitting the piece of stainless steel firmly into the collet using the special spanner that came with the collet chuck when I bought it. The CR40 collet chuck fits into a Moss Taper number 3 hole in the lathe spindle. And I don't really like this because it doesn't allow the bar to go all the way through, as it has a drawbar in the back of it. You will notice that I don't have much of the bar sticking out of the collet, and when I rotate it, it doesn't look like it's running very true. I'm thinking that there could be some metal particles in the spindle itself, and this would make the Morse taper number 3 not run true. The good news is, a really kind viewer has offered to send me one of these ER40 collet chucks, and he makes them himself, and they fit on the outside thread of a Boxford lathe spindle, just like mine. It would be nice to have a piece of equipment made by a professional. The viewer went on to say that he's been in the business a long time, and is now 80 years of age. A proper engineer. But in the meantime, I'm using this one, and it doesn't seem to be running very true, but it's all I have to work with. And really, the camera does exaggerate it. It's not running quite as unevenly as it looks. What I'm having to do is turn down a part of this to a quarter of an inch diameter to fit in the hole in the crank web that I made in the last episode. And even though I can see that it's currently nowhere near, I'll just check with my micrometer. Yes, I was right, it's nowhere near. I'm turning just the end part, and then I check it with the micrometer, and if that's OK, I turn down all the way. And it's getting closer to a quarter of an inch diameter, but not quite. Eventually, by removing very small amounts of metal, I reduce the end of this piece of bar until the micrometer shows a quarter of an inch. This is the crank web, and I've polished it up. That's the inside part that's going to fit on this piece of bar up to the shoulder. At the moment, the end of the bar is just over one thou bigger than a quarter of an inch. And here, I'm removing that one thou very carefully with my cutting tool. You will notice that right at the end of the operation, I plunge the cutting tool in a little bit deeper to remove any radius. Now the crank web is a perfect fit on the end of this piece of bar. Not tight, not slack, just right. As I make this statement, it gives me an idea for an entirely different version of the Three Bears fairy story. But that's enough of that. I'm using some Loctite 603 to permanently fix the crank web to the crankshaft. And as you watch this operation, it should become apparent why I didn't bother machining the other side of the crank web. Now is the time to machine the other end of the crank web, including the piece of bar that sticks out of the middle. I'm not taking very deep cuts because don't forget this crank web is sitting on a quarter of an inch diameter piece of the crankshaft. And the last thing I want to do at this stage is ruin the job. I've decided to make this crank web just slightly thinner than the original because I thought that looked a bit ugly and overscale. 
Also, the brass of the crankweb was rubbing against the edge of the brass bearing, which is never a good idea. So I'm going to fit a steel washer between the crankweb and the bearing, and depending on the thickness of the washer, it will allow for some adjustment to the position of the crankweb relative to the cylinder. It's time now to turn down the outer diameter to match the original crankweb. And once again, I'm using very light cuts. When I think about it, I could have made this crankshaft from one piece of steel, but then it wouldn't have looked like the original, which has a brass crankweb, and also the brass will look good on the finished engine. What I'm doing at the moment is removing sharp edges from the crankweb. I'm using some emery cloth for this, followed by some wet or dry sandpaper, and finished off with a piece of Scotch Brite. And to finally finish the job before removing it, I centre drilled down the middle, like this. Why did I do this? Well, larger crankshafts are generally turned between centres and have centre holes in each end, so the centre serves no purpose other than to be ornamental. That's it for the turning operations in the lathe. Now it's time to mark the position for the crank pin. The position of this hole needs to be 13 sixteenths of an inch from the centre. Now I need to drill a hole in the crankweb that is a perfect 90 degrees to the crankweb face, so I'm making a jig to do this. I've made the jig from a piece of brass, and here I'm removing the burrs from the front and rear. You can see how it works, it has a 3 sixteenths of an inch diameter hole in the centre. Here is a jig clamped in the machine vise, and it allows me to drill a hole perfectly at 90 degrees to the face of the crankweb. First of all with a centre drill, and then following through with a 5 30 seconds of an inch diameter drill, which is tapping size for 2BA. Without removing the crankweb from the jig, I'm tapping the hole using a 2BA tap. And the good thing about this jig is, once the tap breaks through the crankweb, the crankweb will start to lift out of the jig, as you can clearly see here. All I have to do now is withdraw the tap by rotating the chuck in the opposite direction, and after slightly counter drilling and deburring the hole, it's time to fit the crank pin. To lock the crank pin into this threaded hole, I'm using Loctite 243. I am not using Loctite 603. Loctite 243 is not a retainer, it's just a thread locker, which will stop the part from working loose. All I need to do now is take a cloth and wipe off the surplus 243, and the job's finished. Here's a comparison between the old crankshaft and the new one. As you can clearly see from this clip, my crankweb is not quite as thick as the original. Here's a clip of the new crankshaft fitted in position, and I think it's going to look okay. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.